Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. We'll get started in just a minute, um, but just a few um, housekeeping announcements before we begin. Uh, we are recording the event and we'll be posting the video on the Basic Science website um, so we can share it out with uh, alumni and friends. Um, you'll be able to view this video as well as other videos um, in this series and from previous seasons. Um, due to the large number of um, audience members, we are going to keep you all muted during the presentations. Um, but we do want to hear from you. So if you have any questions for any of our panelists, we encourage you to post those in the chat and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, and uh, with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Frances Hellman. Um, she is a professor of physics here at UC Berkeley and the former Dean of Mathematical and Physical Sciences. So Frances, over to you. Good evening. And welcome to the Basic Sciences Lights the Way event. Um, I am Frances Hellman. I'm former Dean of Mathematical and Physical Sciences and Professor of Physics. And I'm really pleased to be joining you today for another of these uh, events. I find the topics both incredibly interesting and very exciting. It's a great inspiration at the end of my day. And of course, they feature one of Berkeley's great traditions and great strengths, basic science research. We launched this series of virtual events towards the end of my tenure as Dean in the midst of the pandemic to try to stay in touch with all of you and to celebrate the breadth and depth of basic science discovery at Berkeley. The goal of this series is to shine a light on how scientific discoveries are made and what it means to be driven by curiosity. Basic does not mean simple, but rather foundational in that it can lead to transformational discoveries. Foundation re foundational research sometimes leads to, to, to some really remarkable paradigm shifting discoveries. At Berkeley, we often point to well-known examples of discoveries that were made because our scientists followed their curiosity and their questions. Immunotherapies for cancer, CRISPR-R, Cas9, the accelerating expansion of the universe and the invention of the laser and maser. All of these breakthroughs built on and in turn advanced the basic sciences that inspires us all. Tonight's topic is the future of quantum materials. We hope this conversation will help elucidate a frontier of both physics and engineering. As a material scientist myself, I'm especially excited to be sharing this topic with you this evening. Our moderator this evening is Bob Bergenau, a distinguished professor of physics and the former chancellor of UC Berkeley. Bob's research interests span condensed matter physics and material science. His remarkable career combines research and teaching in STEM, public policy and leadership in higher education, and he has earned much recognition for his work. It's a great privilege to introduce him and to have him moderating, moderating this session. Over to you, Bob. Thank you, Francis. Francis and I are also co-authors, physics co-authors, by the way. So it's a pleasure for me to participate in today's event, and I'm honored to introduce this audience to some of my colleagues and their work. Uh, I'm going to introduce the subject of quantum materials uh, by recounting a classroom experience that I had in the fall of 1986. I was teaching a senior undergraduate course uh, in solid state physics. Uh, this course enabled the students to understand insulators like table salt that is sodium chloride, semiconductors like silicon, and metals like copper and iron. And it was based on the conventional theory of solids. Late in the semester, I received a paper from a friend, a uh, longtime friend by the name of Alex Mueller, reporting that he had discovered superconductivity at remarkably high temperatures in the most unlikely of places. He and his collaborator, George Bednortz, discovered that by adding some metal fragments, namely barium metal, to a simple ceramic composed of lanthanum, copper, and oxygen, that the ceramic magically converted from being a magnetic insulator, uh, uh, which would not conduct electricity at all, to a metal which conducted electricity perfectly at record high temperatures. Furthermore, according to the theory of solids, which I had just taught the students, 
and which was in all of the textbooks, this was impossible. So I walked into class that day, this is absolutely true, and told the students I needed to apologize. There was something fundamentally wrong with what I was teaching them. And at that stage, I had no idea what it was about. For me, this was incredibly exciting. The students did not like it at all. Alex Mueller and George Bednortz had created the new field of quantum materials which now plays a dominant role in solid state physics research. And just one year later, uh, Alex and George received the Nobel Prize for this incredible discovery. Today, we're going to hear from three inspiring researchers, uh, James Analides, Veronica Sunko, and, and Kwabana Fediako. They will talk about and hopefully demystify quantum materials. And I hope that you will enjoy these enlightening presentations. Uh, at the end of each talk, we'll try to address all of the questions from the audience, or at least some of them. So please add questions in the chat. So our first speaker is Professor James Analides. James Analides is an associate professor and department chair of physics. His research focuses on the discovery and understanding of exotic materials manifesting novel quantum phenomena that have both fundamental and technological implications, particularly superconductors, exotic magnets, and what we call topological insulators. James will be setting the stage of the talk by illuminating some core ideas surrounding quantum materials. Over to you, James. Thanks, Bob. Well, it's my pleasure to be here. Let me start by sharing my screen. Well, um, thanks again, Bob, for that introduction. I, I should probably start by telling you uh, a little bit about my, myself. I did my undergraduate and uh, degree in physics in New Zealand. And at the time, uh, I have to, when I was learning about the standard model of physics, where you learn about all of the uh, fundamental particles that are constituent, the constituents of, of, um, of matter in the universe, uh, you learn about that, but you but I was also learning about uh, the the nature of wave particle duality from my quantum mechanics classes. So, in other words, how each one of these particles had a wave like nature as as well. And to be honest, at the time, I had real trouble coming to grips with this concept. I had um, I really felt like it was a challenge to kind of think of this dual nature of all each of these fundamental particles. And one of the things that drew me to condensed metaphysics and eventually to quantum materials was that not only is this nature explicit in the physics that we that we observe and that we measure in these systems, um, but it's also something that we can visualize. So let me give you an example of the kinds of things that we do at Berkeley. On the left side of the screen here, I show you uh, a transmission electron microscope image of one of the materials that we made in my in my lab. It's a it's iron intercalated niobium sulfide. The bright green spots that make the rows, they're, uh, they're um, the columns, sorry, they're niobium. Uh, and in between those, there are slightly less bright spots of iron. And in between those, if you can squint and have a look, those are actually the sulfur atoms. And those are all glued by electrons in the solid. So I can think of no better example of like how clear uh, the particle-like nature of electrons uh, can be, because you can really locate to where they are in, this, in the system. Uh, another capability that we have here at Berkeley, though, that is that has made our lab fame, uh, that has made uh, this institution famous, is of course uh, an, another technique known as angle resolved photoemission, which leverages the um, the synchrotron up at the up at the lab. Uh, and one of the things that you can measure with this uh, uh, with um, uh, with this experiment is the wave like nature of electrons and solids. So what I'm showing you here on the right is actually a two dimensional image of all the possible wavelengths available to electronic waves traveling in different directions uh, in the material. In the jargon, it's called the Fermi surface, but it really is just all the uh, possible wavelengths available to an electron um, uh, in, a, in, in the solid. So that's, um, 
very neat. It's an explicit and clear way to visualize the wave particle nature of, of electrons and systems. But really what's special about materials is the emergent behavior that comes about from the collective behavior of all of the electrons together. And I'm going to start with an example, and you'll have to forgive the simulations. There's something that I made up, and I'm no artist, uh, admittedly. Uh, but imagine, for example, that you're an atom moving around in a circle. So the purple circle is supposed to be an atom moving around and around. That is a particle. There's no doubt that it's the particle. Let's say I glue this particle to another, to another atom. And it's in the same environment, so it's also making the same kinds of circles. And because of the interactions between these atoms, uh, they start at slightly different points, uh, but they still make trace out the same circles. Now, it's not clear how the motion of these two atoms glued together will eventually lead to emergent particles, but that's actually what's really exciting about, for me, uh, about condensed matter. Let's say I glue 10 of these atoms together. If you look closely, each one of these points is still moving around in the same kind of circle. But because of the way they glue to each other, what emerges is this wave that propagates throughout the whole system. And let's say I do this in two dimensions. Again, if you look closely, each one of those points is just moving around in a nice smooth circle. But because of the way it's glued together with all of the other atoms, if you take a step back, what you'll see is a wave moving from the bottom left to the top right. Do you see that? That in the jargon is uh, called a phonon uh, in, in a crystalline system. It's basically the way we understand vibrations and the propagation of sound uh, in materials. And it's in every sense a quantum particle. We, we map this on to essentially a particle that looks a lot like the particles in the standard model, but we give it a different name, a phonon. And we do this a lot in condensed matter physics. The more complex the system, the more exotic the particles might become. One example is ordered magnets, so ferromagnets that you see glued on your, um, uh, on your refrigerator. The particles describing those systems are called magnons. In metallic systems, we have multiple kinds of particles, things like uh, called electrons and whole quasi particles, or if there's light interacting with an electron, it's called a plasmon. And in superconductors, uh, you have two electrons that can be glued together to form a Cooper pair, and that's a new kind of particle itself. And each one of those, despite the complexity of the system, we usually can identify what the particle actually is from the symmetries of the system. And Veronica will tell you a little bit more about that um, uh, in her talk. So uh, that's all very exciting. It's all very interesting. But what I mean by quantum materials is where this kind of picture, this ability to uh, look at a system and understand the particles that make it, the emergent particles that make it up, when that, system, when that picture breaks down, where you can no longer map that picture uh, onto a particle or an equivalent particle in the standard model. And that's one of the things that I'm excited about and really is at the core of understanding the big problems introduced by Bob, like high temperature superconductivity, where the many body nature of the system just prohibits you being able to look at the system in such a, uh, in, in this um, uh, particle-like way. But I'll give you a way, an, an insight into how we get a handle on this kind of problem. One of the things that we know is important about understanding where and when this particle-like picture breaks down is when you have a transition from one particle-like picture, let's say a paramagnet um, in the, at high temperature, to the magnon particle picture at low temperature, once the system actually becomes a magnet. That transition from one state to the other, that's where the really exotic and difficult physics comes about. It's the same kind of story with superconductors when you go from a metal to a superconductor and so on. And we know that, or at least we suspect, that somehow the breakdown of the particle-like picture is related to the, to the emergent physics that you have across these transitions. And one of the things that we suspect is that these systems have statistical symmetries, an emergent statistical behavior that really just depends entirely on the geometry of the system. Let me tell you a bit about what I mean by that. So you might have come across the concept of fractals. 
So fractals come about, for example, in fjords. So you, you know that when you zoom into a fjord, it kind of looks a lot uh, very much the same as when you zoom out. That's a kind of scale invariance in the system. You can even go to your local supermarket and buy a Romanesco uh, broccoli and see the same kind of self-similar self fractal behavior in the way the, the Romanesco broccoli is, um, is um, constructed. Well, we think, we suspect that a lot of the similar kinds of uh, uh, fractality also comes about, but in the quantum degrees of freedom across these um, exotic materials. And um, don't ask me what this picture is supposed to represent. It's exactly what I, the first image that I Googled when I put quantum fractality, um, but it's actually quite difficult to represent what fractality and quantum degrees of freedom means because it's, it's, it's that self-similar behavior, that statistical behavior that doesn't come about just in space as in fjords and, and Romanesco broccoli, but also in time as well. And that's what makes the, the science difficult, but it also makes it exciting. One of the things that we try and do in my lab to try and get a handle on this problem is because like the physics of scale becomes important, we try and leverage the, the state of the art uh, nanofabrication and synthesis facilities that we have here at Berkeley. So one of the things that we do is we can shape materials into different geometries, and that can actually give you a handle on the internal physics. In this case, shaping a material like a triangle or a rectangle actually affects the properties that you see. Sometimes you see exotic surface states uh, arising from um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 in these quantum materials. And in order to see those, you sometimes want to make um, very, very thin devices, which we again do uh, using the um, uh, facilities here at Berkeley. But what's neat about this, when we first did this experiment uh, in 2016, is that it kind of opened the, the door to actually making prototype devices out of quantum materials as well. So that niobium sulfide, the iron and turcaline niobium sulfide that I, that I uh, talked to you about at the very beginning of the talk, well, we actually turned that into uh, a way to store memory, magnetic memory, by leveraging the exotic complex physics of the system itself. And even though we don't fully understand what that complex physics actually uh, looks like internally, it didn't stop us from making a memory storage device that works at a thousand times lower power and 10 times as fast as any other comparable material out there. So, What's cool about quantum materials is that it's not just the fundamental physics that's out there, but there is actually some really neat, possibly game-changing applications as well. So in my lab, what we do is uh, we synthesize the materials, which is what you see my students be doing here on the left. We also characterize them um, at cryogenic temperatures, which is what you see on the, on the right. And very recently, we've tried to translate some of these uh, ideas to quantum devices. And I was very proud to, um, uh, to, to that my student, uh, Shannon Haley and postdoc Aran Maneev uh, got on the cover of the physics magazine as we advanced towards this kind of technology. Okay, that's me. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Yeah, okay, I'm unmuted. Um, we welcome questions in the chat by the chat function, uh, but uh, in anticipation of questions in chat, let me just ask, um, James, in your capacity as chair of the physics department, uh, maybe you can tell us uh, what what is it that makes UC Berkeley one of the world leaders in the field of quantum materials? So I would say uh, uh, two main components. So first of all, um, because we're a premier institution, we still attract um, the best students and faculty to our campus. So we have some of the world leaders in this kind of science uh, from the microscopic uh, imaging that I was talking about before with uh, STM and Micromi or the angle resolved photo mission like Alessandro Lanzara or the kinds of measurements that, that you do, Bob, uh, uh, with uh, neutron diffraction and X-ray diffraction and all the variety of spectroscopies that we have. So we still managed to attract the best faculty and students. But in addition to that, I, I don't think we can overlook the importance of having a state-of-the-art facility right nearby, like the synchrotron, the, the advanced light source, because that has enabled a number of um, uh, different um, uh, tools to characterize materials that are really available only here at Berkeley. And they're just in our backyard. 
everything from imaging materials on the nanoscale through to spectroscopies that couple to uh, resonant excitations of specific elements so you know where your spin is coming from or where your charge is coming from. So it's the, it's the partnership of the state-of-the-art facilities and uh, the community that we have that I think are the two most important components. Excellent. Let me just add also a number of brilliant theorists who help us understand. Oh, did I forget oh. about them? Yeah, right, you're right. <laughs> Actually, as far as theory goes, uh, Berkeley is absolutely world leading and um, yeah. Uh, okay, so th thank you so much. Uh, and so let's go on to the next speaker. There'll be lots of time for questions in the end, at least the ample time, I believe. Yeah, um, I'm happy to talk about interdepartmental collaboration, which is what just came up on the chat. So we'll yeah. do that at the end. Okay. That's uh, and, and that's uh, Veronica Sunko. So Veronica Sunko came, has come to Berkeley as a Miller Fellow, which is a very prestigious fellowship here at Berkeley, from the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Physics of Solids in Germany. Uh, she got her PhD from the University of St. Andrews in Scotland in 2019. She was awarded the Green Dissertation Award for Experimental Condensed Matter Physics from the American Physical Society, uh, of which uh, Francis Hellman is the past president, uh, or maybe the current president. Uh, she'll correct me later if that's correct, as well as the Springer Thesis uh, Award. Her work revolves around using light to uncover properties of new quantum materials and developing new optical methods to do so. Veronica. All right. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. And also thank you for the opportunity to tell you today a little bit about my research. So um, as you can probably tell from my title, I will be talking about how can we use light to uncover symmetry of quantum materials. And so this is my new, um, my new interest. And I spend a lot of my time working on developing these techniques. But before I tell you a little bit more about how this works, I just want to show you a picture of a number of quantum materials. And so the reason I'm showing you this is that even without knowing anything more about their properties um, or, or about the amazing uh, phenomena that James was talking about, you can immediately see a huge diversity. So you can see that these materials look in very different ways. Some are black, some are colorful, some are shiny, some are not. And this gives you a first glimpse of the remarkable um, diversity of properties uh, that can be found in, in, in these families. But now to go beyond the first glimpse and to actually learn more about the underlying physics of these, of these systems, we need to use very dedicated and specialist experimental techniques. And so uh, on that note, for example, we might use light to uncover some properties, or we might, uh, might force an electrical current through go through a material and then learn how easy or difficult it is for it to do so. We can do all of this at very low temperatures, which helps us bring out the inherent quantum behavior. And we can also do it in extreme environments, such as very high magnetic fields or, or high pressures. And all of this helps us learn what's happening in the material. And so recently I've been, uh, I've been using light to look at materials. And in particular, I I'm using here a picture of a light bulb, but actually in our experiments, we use lasers, which allows us a lot of precision and accuracy in, in our measurements. And so I will tell you a little bit about actual experiments that we are designing and doing, but before I do that, I want to show you what's, my, what's the motivation for the latest work I've been doing. And so the motivation is that our collaborators looked at a material which looks very much like this one. It's a little black thing, a little black platelet. Uh, this is its chemical formula. And then they discovered a very unusual behavior. So what they saw is that if they measured the electrical resistivity, this is a measure of how difficult it is to electrons, for electrons to go through this material, they saw that it's, it's relatively easy for electrons in the large range of temperatures. But when it gets cold, it suddenly becomes much more difficult for electrons to go through, resistivity goes up, and then it goes back down. And so this was not understood. It wasn't understood why this is happening. And we wanted to try to understand better by studying the symmetries of this material uh, uh, at these temperatures. And so to do this, uh, we first have to understand what I mean by symmetries in, in quantum materials. And so you know probably that all materials contain atoms like this one. 
And one source of diversity of the properties and appearance of materials that I've shown is that there is a huge choice of atoms in building those materials. We have the whole periodic table to choose from. But the second source of all of this um, the variety of behavior is the arrangement of atoms in materials. And so, for example, the atoms, you, let's imagine that each one of these balls is a single atom, the atoms could be arranged in these little squares, or they could be arranged in rectangles, like I'm showing here, or, for example, triangles or hexa hexagons, or there are many, many more complicated arrangements than those. And so, each one of these arrangements has its own symmetries, and together with the atoms which make up the materials, they, they determine the properties that can be observed. And just to emphasize the importance of these symmetries, uh, coal, I'm showing here, and diamond actually contain the same atoms, it's all carbon atoms, but they are arranged in different ways. So now, of course, coal and diamond are very different, and we don't need any specialist techniques to tell that they're different. But the changes of symmetries in materials can be very subtle, and, to, and they can, even, even though they're subtle, they can have huge consequences. And so to detect those subtle changes, we develop special experimental techniques, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about those. Okay. So what I've been uh, doing lately with, with my research group is to use, um, to take a little bit of a material, say this blue square-like material, and we take uh, light, so laser light, we bounce it off the sample like of a mirror, but now this light that's reflected has been changed due to its interaction with the material. Okay. Now we take the same sample and we rotate it by 90 degrees and we repeat the same experiment. But because this material is so symmetric, when we rotate it by 90 degrees, nothing happens and we get the same result. Now, in contrast, if we take the green, less symmetric material, we do our bouncing experiment, we now rotate the sample by 90 degrees. Now there is a change because originally this long axis was horizontal and now a short axis is horizontal. So now there is a difference. And so what we actually measure is a difference in the result of the two experiments, the two rotations. It's zero in the symmetric case and different from zero in the less symmetric case. And so this allows us to uncover very, very small changes in symmetry on the order of one part in a million. And just to get you a, give you a feeling for how small those changes are, if we were instead measuring the height of our favorite Berkeley Tower, we could tell the difference between its actual height and its height plus the width of a human hair. So we're very, very sensitive. OK, but everything I talked about so far is to do with spatial symmetries, so symmetries in space. And James already hinted that there is another type of symmetry that's important for quantum materials, and that's the symmetry in time. Now, this is extremely counterintuitive because we feel that you know, time goes in one direction. There is no symmetry there. Um, and indeed, this is uh, true in some cases. So if I show you these two photographs of a jar, you know very well that this one, the one on the left, was taken before one on the right. Time is flowing this way. We know that. Uh, because you can't, you can't from a broken jar get the whole one. But the reason this is the case is that energy was lost when the sound was made and these pieces flew away. If I show you something else, if I show you uh, these pictures of, of a basketball, you can't actually tell uh, which way the time is going. Is the ball going this way or that way? Okay, equally obviously perhaps, if I show you just a picture of a material sitting on a table and not moving, again, you can't tell whether time is going this way or that way. You can't tell if I'm showing you a movie going in real time or backwards. But remarkably, due to quantum mechanical properties, this is actually not true for all materials. And in particular, it's not true for magnets. So if I have a magnet with its north and south pole, it's like a fridge magnet, and time is flowing in one direction, if I had a magical button that would rewind time, this magnet would actually change, although it wasn't moving. So the North Pole becomes the South and vice versa. And so we also develop sensitive experimental techniques to detect this sort of time reversal symmetry breaking, which is how we call this effect in quantum materials. And so we do that in a way which is very similar to the spatial symmetry breaking. We repeat our bounce off and rotate the sample experiment, but we now repeat it with the sample feeling a magnetic field, so being close to a north pole of a magnet. And then we repeat it again with the sample feeling being close to a, a south pole of a magnet. 
And we take differences between all of these configurations, which again allows us to be extremely sensitive. Now we can tell if both space and time symmetry is good broken. You may remember initially I motivated this experiment by an observation which wasn't understood, this big, big pick here. But then when we did such experiments on the same material, we realized that in this range of temperatures, both time and space symmetries were broken. And this helps us understand why this behavior occurs in this material. So here I've given you one sort of story of motivation and actual experimental development that we've been working on in the last year. Um, but this is a pretty common storyline in the field of quantum materials, and I think it's a lot of fun. We often have a new material which hasn't been looked at before. It's perhaps made in James's group. And there is some sort of an unusual observation related to it. We need to recognize that the observation is unusual. We then think about how to probe this observation experimentally. We design new experiments to do so. This often allows us to discover and understand something that wasn't understood before. And this leads to new questions um, and, and a new understanding as well. And so with this, I will stop and I welcome any questions. Thank you, Veronica. That was really excellent. Uh, let's see, I don't see any new questions in chat yet. So let me ask you a question. So one of the characteristics of this field of quantum materials is that it appears that for any for any system like the one that you just showed us, there's no single probe that will tell you help you understand all of the physics, right? Which is quite different from kinds of research people of yeah. my generation did, you know, 30 years ago or something like that, right? So, uh, uh, so yeah. How do, how do these optical measurements fit into the overall strategy that people use yeah. to try and understand quantum materials? Yeah, thank you very much for that question. This really taps in into something that I find incredibly interesting and inspiring in this in this field, which is that we really so many complicated things are happening in all of these materials. And that's precisely the interesting point that we need to really work together and approach every problem from many angles and compare and contrast the answers to come up to the understanding of the, on the underlying picture. So that I find very interesting. And this is in part why I started doing this optical techniques, which was different from, from what I did in my, in my, in my previous work. So specifically, the reason I was interested in the optical techniques is this specific sensitivity to symmetry, which is one of the ways in which we um, in which we characterize one of the one of the ways in which we can understand the behaviors of quantum materials. Of course, this doesn't give a full picture, and I think in particular it's very interesting to compare um, the the optical techniques, which are sensitive to local uh, local we call it the point group symmetry, with scattering techniques, which are sensitive to the arrangements over over longer periodicity. So I think that's a very promising avenue. Um, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Good. Okay, uh, let's now go on to the third speaker, Pavana uh, Bediako. Uh, so Pavana, he's an assistant professor in the College of Chemistry. His research interests are in the areas of uh, inorganic materials chemistry, electrochemistry, and magnetism uh, in atomically thin materials. His research group develops new chemical and electrochemical methodologies that are used to design new quantum materials and modified their exotic properties. And as you will learn very soon, uh, he also has an absolutely fascinating personal history. So Kwamina, please, please tell Great. us about your research. Sure, thank you, uh, Bob, for that um, introduction. So my name, yes, is uh, Kwamina Bidiako. I'm an assistant professor uh, in the Department of Chemistry. So I think there was a question earlier about cross-disciplinary uh, collaborations, and I think, um, I won't get a chance to talk about it today, but James and I uh, are actually uh, uh, collaborating more and more uh, these uh, days. So um, yeah, we're happy to talk to you about that a little bit. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my work, but I'd like to begin by uh, giving you a little bit of a backstory um, and to help you understand the questions that motivate my work. Um, I was born in Ghana, which is in West Africa. And uh, if you know where uh, Ghana is, then Fantastic. If you don't, it's right at the arrow. And, and that's where I grew up until coming to the US for college. And uh, if you visited Ghana, you'll know it's a beautiful country. Uh, if you haven't visited Ghana, you should. Um, but uh, growing up in the 80s and 90s, 
Um, as a middle income country, we occasionally had power outages and those stemmed from our over-reliance on one hydroelectric power station uh, that was uh, installed on the river Volta. And that formed this lake called the Volta Lake, which I uh, show here. And, and that's actually the largest artificial lake in the world, uh, just uh, as a little, little fact there. Um, so I actually went to elementary school uh, near the Volta Lake. Here's a, a picture, a view of the lake from a vantage point near my school. But these power outages uh, that we experienced occasionally got me uh, interested in thinking quite a bit about energy. And I knew that there were other countries that were faring far worse than we were. And so seeing as we were blessed with a lot of sun in Ghana, from a young age, it was quite obvious to me that, you know, um, and I started getting interested in solar energy. And that ultimately was the focus of my PhD. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have enough time to tell you about that part of my career today, but it is this long-standing interest in energy broadly that motivates what my group uh, does now. And so the basic science that we do is motivated by two, two questions. The first one is stated on the top of the slide, how can we produce fuels and chemicals sustainably? So that involves thinking a lot about how to move charge efficiently across a solid liquid interface. And, and that's the one part of my lab that I'm not going to talk about today. Uh, but the other challenge um, that uh, is, is more tied into what we're talking about today has to do with our uh, accelerating reliance as a society on electronic devices and computing. And so there's an explosion of data in this world, and you can see this uh, by following the annual uh, uh, internet traffic, all right? So there, and there is an energy cost to this accelerating production and transfer of data. I'm here in Berkeley, uh, you're all um, uh, across the country, maybe across the world, and we're transmitting uh, these slides, the sound, this video, and there is actually an energy cost uh, to that. And, and fortunately, so far, this explosion in data that we've been generating and transferring has been mitigated by rapid improvements in computing efficiency. And so that has maintained our CO2 emissions from information and uh, communication technology to about 2% uh, total. Uh, which for context is quite is comparable to that of the aviation industry uh, flying. Now, there's an important challenge on the horizon, uh, which is that for the last five decades or so, we've managed to double the number of transistors on chips every couple of years. This is the trend known as Moore's law that you might be familiar with. But as we reach the physical limits of silicon-based transistor miniaturization, and, and that is really what has helped with increasing energy efficiency of electronic devices, which has kept pace with our demand so far, we have to find new schemes for, for ultra low power electronic computing technologies that allow us to continue to increase the energy efficiency of our devices uh, with, with this increasing demand. And, and James' result um, that he shared with you with this really low switching uh, uh, data storage is one fantastic example of, of, I think, how quantum materials can help uh, in that regard. So, in my lab, we work at this interface of chemistry and physics. We, we try to ask fundamental questions about how we can control the physics of solids and surfaces to tailor interfacial chemistry. Again, not gonna talk about today. But then the second part of my lab asks, how can we use our chemical intuition, um, methods for synthetic chemistry, uh, structural characterization to engineer ex exotic physics and solids um, and, and ask how these exotic properties emerge anticipating that these basic science discoveries may lead to the types of phenomena that could drive new paradigms of low power, uh, low energy electronic devices. And the building blocks we use in designing these materials, these new materials are called two-dimensional or 2D material. And you might be familiar with the poster child 2D material, which is graphene. This is a single layer of carbon atoms in a hexagonal arrangement. So here's a great example of uh, how symmetry um, uh, uh, impacts materials properties. And because of the symmetry and all some of the other in ingredients that Veronica talked about, graphene provides some really extraordinary demonstrations of quantum effects. Um, so in a monolayer of graphene, for example, these electron quasi particles uh, that James alluded to, they move basically like photons or like light. They have effectively zero, uh, zero mass within the solid. They move at a constant speed irrespective of the energy. Um, that, that, that they carry. So that's you know, ultraviolet light, UV light. It, it moves with the speed of light, uh, even though they have very different energies. Electrons don't usually behave this way in solids, but in graphene they do. Uh, and they're usually unaffected by one another and they're not scattered easily um, off, uh, off of uh, defects or impurities in the lattice. And this gives rise to a remarkably high electron mobility. Okay. 
Now, what is quite interesting is that if you take two layers of graphene and you stack them together, but with a twist um, as sort of animated here, you find that there's a much longer range pattern that emerges on top of the atomic lattice, all right? Uh, and this pattern is called a, a, a moiré super lattice. Uh, and, and the twist angle between the layers controls the size of this pattern, which is the modulation and crystallographic registry between the layers. So what does this have to do with what I was talking about? Well, excitingly, in 2018, some physicists at MIT were successful in performing some experiments that identify what might happen in such a moiré super lattice. And what they observed were a range of electronic phenomena that arose from strong interactions between electrons. So remember that in graphene that is not twisted, I said the electrons don't really interact strongly at all. So just by twisting two layers of graphene, what they found was they had completely reformatted the interactions between the electrons, so much so that the graphene can be changed from a metal that you know, conducts electricity to an unusual insulating state. This is called a correlated insulator, and then back to a metal. And then if you cool it down uh, to low temperatures, uh, the graphene uh, displays unconventional superconductivity. And there are many open questions about the relationship between the type of superconductivity observed in these twisted graphene uh, layers and the high temperature superconductors that Bob mentioned earlier. So my group was interested in, in understanding and taking a closer look uh, at the structure of these Mari superlattices to see if this cartoon picture that I'm showing over here in the bottom left and that I showed you with that animation, does that really hold true? Because as chemists, we're really interested um, in understanding structure. So to do this, we use a cutting edge mode of microscopy that's called four-dimensional scanning transmission electron microscopy, or 4D STEM, where we raster a focus beam of electrons. So it's microscopy, but in this case, not with light, but instead using electron beams. We raster them across uh, our moiré super lattice pattern. And at each position, we measure the pattern formed by the electrons as they pass through and scatter or diffract off of the atoms. Um, and so at each position in our sample, a pixelated array detector precisely counts the number of electrons that strike each point in the detector. Um, and, and this technique is, is, is one that we conduct at the National Center for Electron Microscopy just up the hill. Another example of um, some of the unique uh, uh, features that uh, Berkeley offers uh, by being in close proximity to a national lab. Okay, so what we end up with are tens of thousands of patterns that look something like this. Uh, and my students in their genius um, figured out that they could use the interference between the electron waves scattered from the sample, because remember electrons have this particle wave duality and the electron waves can inter interfere with each other. And by uh, understanding the effect of this interference, they, can, they were able to solve a major problem in mapping out the structure of uh, these moiré super lattice patterns. And so at the end of all of this, what uh, we learned was that this cartoon picture of twisted bilayer graphene that I showed you was not accurate at all. That structure, it turns out, is really unstable. Instead of each graphene layer staying rigid when you twist it, each layer respond, uh, spontaneously undergoes an additional series of twists and counter twists that relax the, 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 the atomic lattice to a new structure. Uh, and we we're able to measure precisely how that happens for the first time just last year. So I'm showing you two examples uh, of this new structure that we measured here, where each color at each pixel encodes information about the local stacking orientation of, of the layers, how exactly they're arranged. And you can see very sharp boundaries between orange to white to blue to red and so on as you move around. And this is in contrast to the cartoon picture uh, that I showed, which would, uh, if, if, if that held true, that would have resulted uh, in a much more gradual change or bleeding from an orange to a white uh, as we, we go around and not these sharp distinctive uh, uh, domains or boundaries. So these structural insights helped us to uh, contribute to a deeper understanding of exactly how the strong correlations or strong interactions emerge in these moiré systems and what causes them to be destroyed. Okay, now I'll just end with this slide that, um, you know, twist is just one of the degrees of freedom, one of the, the tuning knobs that we have to control uh, the properties of quantum materials. And these 2D materials are really versatile platforms for our, for our work, because in addition to this interlayer twist, we can control the number of layers that we have. We can stack them on top of each other like atomic scale Legos. We can insert or intercalate, as I said, ions in atoms, ions, molecules in between the layers, like, like in James's material. And all of these 
tuning knobs, some of them chemical, some of them a bit more mechanical or physical, they alter the physics and chemistry in terms of, of, of these materials, uh, leading to um, new properties that are driven by these strong, uh, strongly interacting electrons. And here's my group that did all the work. I'm eternally grateful to them. And, and here's James right here in the, in the collaborators list. And, and the other thing that makes Berkeley amazing is it are these collaborations and the all-star cast uh, that we can really get together to solve difficult problems. So with that, thank you. I hope there's time for questions. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, uh, one of the things that strikes me immediately is just the phenomenal range of systems that uh, characterize and make up quantum materials, which go way beyond you know conventional materials that people focused on uh, up until the, the late 80s. Uh, Kwabana, how soon can we expect to see low power electronics that actually incorporate 2D quantum materials? Well, I think uh, at the rate James is moving, uh, maybe very, very soon. Because <laughs> he's. I think it's. Big. I think it's going to come from you, not me. Uh, oh, I don't know. Sure. <laughs> no, that's not be too modest. <laughs> no, I think it's not too far. I hope it's not too far in the future. Um, you know, one example. It's not quite uh, related to a, a, a sort of electron interactions or quantum effects. It has to do with a quantum material, but Intel. Um, in collaboration with a few other labs, one, one from the school across the bay that we won't name, uh, showed that uh, they could make electrical contacts uh, very, very cleanly to um, molybdenum, a uh, type of 2D material called molybdenum disulfide, which it, it, uh, it, it doesn't really make use of any uh, quantum effects or any electron electron effects necessarily, but it does solve one problem, one limitation of silicon based. Uh, uh, transistor electronics. So um, I think already we might see 2D materials perhaps in the you know, next decade or two decades or so maybe making their way into some of these systems. Um, it might be a little bit, a uh, few more uh, years before we see some of these quantum effects um, being exploited. Okay. Terrific. Uh, okay, now I think we're going to transition to uh, questions for all three speakers. Uh, and there was an early question in the chat, which I thought uh, was an interesting one. It was from a person who was, uh, and any of you are welcome to answer this question. So uh, this person says that when he or she was a graduate student, that at that time when we talked about superconductivity, it was only Cooper pairs. And you know, superconductivity occurred in simple metals lead, you know, mercury, aluminum, et cetera, right? Uh, and so uh, maybe you can elaborate a little bit on uh, one of you on what's special about high temperature superconductors and what makes them different from ordinary superconductors and, you know, what, what will we need uh, to accomplish in order to understand them? I can try my perspective on it, but I'm sure uh, both Veronica and Kwabana and you, Bob, have um, opinions on this. Um, I, I think that the basic idea is that the superconductivity in high TC is still mediated by Cooper pairs. So we still have, we have a lot of evidence that, you know, it's still pairs of electrons that are involved in the, um, uh, in the superconducting condensate. The question really is one of what glues those electrons together. So let me try and explain why that's a very difficult problem. And traditional, um, uh, B what's called BCS superconductivity, so Bardeen Cooper Schrieffer, who came up with the original theory of the main successful theory of superconductivity, was that in order to pair those electrons, you needed to glue them together with a phonon. So those phonons that I showed you uh, in my slides, so those can actually be particles that glue together to two electrons, um, and um, and make that and make that bond. the The nice thing about that theory is that in a solid you have an infinite number of phonons. You can just create them just by uh, uh, as many as many as you like. They're a kind of particle co called the boson. So there's really no limit to the numbers you can have. In high TC, the problem becomes challenging because we know what pairs the electrons is probably not phonons, but what we think it is, is to do with some kind of magnetic excitation. So remember, the, the, so a lot of those um, high temperature superconductors are, are, are near 
uh, a magnetic instability. And so something like a magnon, sometimes called a paramagnon, might be what's mediating the superconductivity. But here's why that, that, that mechanism is a problem. Every time, so the, every time you pair one of the, one of the uh, two, two of those electrons, you take two spins out of the problem, right? So every time you, so if, if it's some magnetic interaction between the electrons that's actually mediating the pairing, every time you pair, make a Cooper pair, you take, a, you take some of the magnetic interactions out. So the problem becomes continuously what we call renormalized. You have to basically look at the problem. Uh, every time you make a Cooper pair, it's a slightly different problem than it was before. So it's like the magnetic interaction that's pairing the Cooper pairs is tied to um, the thing that's being paired itself. Whereas in BCS, those two things are separate. Phonons are pairing the electrons, the electrons are things that are being paired. But in high TC, those two things are tied together, the glue and the thing that's being glued are the one and the same object. And that's what really makes high TC a very difficult problem to solve and understand. Um, so uh, even though there's still Cooper pairs involved, it's just an extremely challenging problem to, uh, to actually solve. Terrific. Um, actually, just to add to that, so the traditional superconductors, the ones discovered by Bednarts and Mueller, are based on two-dimensional sheets of copper and oxygen. Uh, and in particular, the approach that James just described is, is particularly pertinent for them. But uh, in, the, in uh, 2007, 2008, workers in Japan and China discovered a completely new family, completely unexpected, uh, based on iron and arsenic. And so, I mean, who could have ever expected that? And, and in the iron and in those systems, besides the magnetism, there's also other degrees of freedom, one of which is analogous to ordering in liquid crystals, which we call nematicity, and I won't try and try and explain it. But so the characteristic of these system of the high temperature superconductors is that they're extremely complex with multiple different kinds of orderings which compete with each other in exactly the way that James just described. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we need all of the different kinds of approaches that you've just heard from these uh, three, three different uh, people, including, uh, I think we can't emphasize too much uh, the uh, importance of national facilities in much of the research that we do. Um, so, let me ask you, coming back to uh, academics, uh, maybe each of you can talk about how undergraduates and graduate students fit into your research programs. Let's start. Kwabana? OK, I guess uh, since I've been cold called. Yeah, so, um, well. I, I think, you know, we're all here. I, I, I'm here and, you know, because I was, uh, somebody gave me a shot uh, as an undergraduate doing, doing research, right? And, and that got me excited about research, about discovery and uh, sort of the open-endedness of research. And then that led to grad school and so on. And so I really value uh, undergraduate research. I think we have, uh, we have a large undergraduate population, uh, Berkeley and chemistry, and, and uh, particularly, I think. Uh, and, and so um, so undergraduates are a really important part of my research group. I have seven undergraduates right now. And, and so the way we usually uh, involve them in research is um, they're able to uh, get credit for doing research over the course of the semester. I usually pair them up with a senior graduate student or a postdoc to mentor them. And uh, we hold special mini uh, group meetings with them um, uh, every other week or so um, to get updates on how they're doing, help them to learn, uh, to develop their scientific communication. Um, and, and then they carry out uh, full-time research over the summer. And uh, so that, that's just sort of one example of what we do in my lab. Veronica? 
So yeah. you're a postdoc. I'm a postdoc, so my, my perspective is slightly different. I don't have my own research group, uh, but I work closely with several students. And I, I think it really can't be uh, overemphasized how important the contribution of students is in various ways, one of which is, of course, the day-to-day -day, um, research. So both work in the lab in setting up these experiments and then thinking about interpreting them and so on. Um, and, and then of, also, I think, for, for senior graduate students, postdocs, and, and professors later, I think it's really, really valuable to interact with younger students who are uh, you know, f f fresh and open-minded, and they ask all sorts of questions. And I think it, it is important to, to, um, to continue being able to give good answers to questions that students ask. It also makes us reflect on what's important for one's career and research, because those questions come up in conversations often, and I think um, I think that's really important. Uh, also, students are often very incredibly interactive. They have lots of, um, they have cohorts and friends from different research groups and different departments. And that's also one of the ways in which I think uh, intergroup and interdepartmental collaboration is, is uh, maintained. James? Yeah, well, as you know, this issue of undergraduate research is very close to my heart, Bob. So um, one of my ambitions as chair was to try and give every uh, physics major an, an undergraduate research experience. And one of the reasons for that is because I do think um, it can be a life changing experience. And given the community, the breadth of the community that we serve, um, you really want to we really have an opportunity here at Berkeley to shift the needle and, and give those life-changing opportunities to a really large fraction of the public. Uh, so um, for me, it's made an enormous difference to the dynamism of our, of our group uh, individually. So one of, the, one of the things that we have is we have like a, a personal, what we call a personal growth day, ironically named. Um, but the idea is that every undergraduate kind of proposes a, a new idea for a new material to grow. And then we team up and then just go do it and see what happens. And very often, you know, sometimes it's actually translated into a long-term graduate project, but it just creates a very dynamic, vibrant environment to have people that, um, uh, um, you know, don't know everything already or don't pretend to know everything already. And they're just there to, to learn. And that's really fun. The other thing that I would say that to add to what Veronica and Kwabana already said was it also provides an opportunity for mentoring. And I think that's something that um, traditionally PhD programs don't do very well is to teach graduate students how to be good mentors. Um, I hope that's a fair statement. But the, so the, the opportunity that it presented um, people in my group, but also I think graduate students in the department is that um, if we actually pay our graduate students just a little bit, like I give, I, I give my graduate students like $1,000 every time they mentor an undergraduate, and the idea is that they're really regarded as a job, right? It's not that much money, but it really they really regard it as I'm being rewarded for something that I, I should learn how to do. So they come up with a mentoring plan, a research plan. They, uh, they figure out like when they're going to give their undergraduates opportunities to speak and what their milestones are. So all of those things have really, I think, really helped my students become leaders um, as they go to the next stage. Yeah, I think not all of us, right? I mean, that's why we're academics, actually, because simply, uh, simply love love the process. Uh, uh, before handing it over to uh, back to Francis, I want to make one comment, uh, which just listening to you and the, the, these fabulously talented people we've just heard from. Uh, in a previous life, when I was the dean of science at MIT, at that time, it was popular for people to write uh, op eds about the end of science. That is that all of the important problems in science had been uh, had been answered, and it was my job at the time, uh, uh, in, in the MIT context, to you know write short articles on wait a second, right? And if you just think about what's happened since then, including this growth of this uh, uh, field of, of uh, quantum materials, how about CRISPR, right? Which we didn't know, right? In biology, how about how about uh, gravitational waves, which no one had ever seen at, at, at uh, in the middle 90s. So this is, you know, the, this incredible advances that are occurring now in solid state physics and a rebirth of solid state physics, really, that you've heard about today. is just illustrative of how there are always new discoveries and there are new layers and there are unexpected phenomena, which is why it makes it so exciting to both study and to participate in 
research. So with that, let me now hand it over to uh, the appropriate person uh, who can maybe uh, uh, swing off of this, Francis Hellman, our previous dean and also uh, close friend to all of us, Francis. Well, thanks, Bob, and thank you to James and to Veronica and to Pabana for you know for sharing this glimpse into this the future and and the present of quantum materials. Um, I I loved some of your discussion. I love the I loved your presentations about the ideas and where the science is going, and I loved your comments about students. And personally, I've you know James' comment about the undergraduates. Um, some of my most best, most um, forward-looking uh, projects have started as undergrad projects. And so it, it's, um, it, is, it is a fun way to do research, to try and get that young energy into the lab. And so it's, it's, it's great. Um, so with that, um, you know, really probably the best part about this event series is hearing the excitement conveyed by our researchers. And I hope you all felt that tonight. Uh, it sparks my intellectual curiosity. I find it inspiring to hear from these minds pondering over and working on these fundamental scientific questions. Um, I really hope that these that you leave these events similarly inspired to explore your own intellectual curiosities and to learn more about what you heard tonight. Um, so I want to thank you for joining us today. I want to encourage you to reach out if you'd like to learn more about anything that we covered. We will be sharing additional resources with you by email about today's topics and today's speakers. And a video of today's session will be available at the uh, basicsciences.berkeley.edu website approximately a week from today. Um, so we look forward to seeing you, at, hopefully many of you, at our next Basic Science Lights the Way event, uh, which is the life of a brain from development to degeneration on April 20th. And until then, stay curious, fiat looks, and go bears. <laughs>